In 2001, at the age of 21, Yvonne Kamati made history by becoming the youngest person in Kenya to be elected into the executive committee of the political party Ford Kenya. Back when she was just 17, she had served as the international coordinator of the World Youth Organization on Climate Change, engaging world leaders on climate change. At the tail end of the 20th century, long before the phenomenon became a buzzword. By the time she was 21, she became the youngest person to have been appointed to the East African Parliament. In May 2007, at just 24, she was appointed ambassador and permanent representative of Kenya to Ethiopia. This automatically qualified her as the youngest envoy ever in Kenya and the whole of Africa in this era, and only second to Salim Salim of Zanzibar who was appointed ambassador to the United Nations at 22. Let's welcome to PLOS TV Africa, Ambassador, Director, Foreign Services, Kenya Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Yvonne Kamati. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. It's did I miss here. out anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how has the experience been for you? Um, 24, that's... That's pretty young. Yes, I was actually just speaking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said, when I, when I, actually, when I ran for parliament, forget 24, when I ran for parliament, I was 21, almost 21. And um, at that point, the opposition had a young presidential candidate by the name of Uhuru Kenyatta, and his running mate was Musale Modavadi, and they called themselves Young Turks. And one of the political analysts said, if you call yourselves Young Turks, Yvonne must be a baby Turk. So it's been a nickname that has uh, stuck <laughs> all, all through. And that's how it's been, being young, being female, uh, and mostly being single, you know? Three of the big issues and headaches uh, in, in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> when well, 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 aside from these challenges, is there mm -hmm. one particular one you can point to as something you had to face because you were a woman? Yes, I, when I ran for office, uh, political office, I faced lots of challenges. All those the financial challenges, uh, then the three issues I've raised young, female, single. But one thing I was not prepared for was the violence. And um, I remember a time that my convoy was attacked and they threw stones and we had to get out and we were beaten by our opponent, like literally beaten up. And I was hospitalized. And I remember that evening that uh, the party leaders, the party leadership, former President Mwai Kibaki then was chairperson, uh, former Right Honorable Prime Minister Raila Odinga, and then my own party leader, uh, who was, who was uh, late Vice President Michael Wamalwa, they came to hospital to see me. And here I was thinking they were coming to empathize and sympathize. And Honorable Raila Odinga said to me, Yvonne, welcome to politics. This is baptism <laughs> by fire. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> well, what were your thoughts then? Were you thinking of just backing out after the violence or you, you, you felt motivated? I was, I was very angry. And I thought that, you know, I mean, I was, I was a fortunate candidate and I had lots of support. And I just wondered what happens to other young people that don't have the support system that I do. Um, and that got me going, and I didn't stop then. And I, and I would like to think that uh, one of the reasons that we've seen many more young women stand for office uh, is because I, I, I led the way and I didn't back out. In Africa, it's assumed that if a woman, you said something about being single, at the time. Are you still single at this point? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then, how did it feel? How did it make me feel? I don't think I've ever been bothered about what other people think and what other people feel. And perhaps that's what is needed with uh, women getting into politics. Is you need to be like a horse in a race course and have blinders and blinkers. You see, every horse on the course has blinkers, meaning you don't look right, you don't look left. You're not looking at the people that are cheering you, you're not looking at the people that are booing you, you're looking at the finishing line. And so long as you have your eyes on the goal, and that's what, where your focus is, then that's where you're going to go.
Okay, let's let's take this a little to politics now. Nigeria's mm -hmm. election, uh, general election, is coming yes. in 2019, and many are concerned that doesn't seem to be much change in the number of women participating um, in politics. But there are those that will argue that the political space expands and shrinks uh, for women uh, from time to time, basically. Mm -hmm. It does not seem that the results are sustained. Why is it that women are not coming out as they should? How is your country faring in this regard? I think that uh, we've made great strides. But if we're going to speak about women empowerment in the continent, I think that the country we need to look at is Rwanda. Uh, in Rwanda, they have been able to achieve 50-50 parity in cabinet in the public service and civil service. And in Kenya, we have made great strides. I mean, we have three women governors. I'm looking forward to the day that uh, Nigeria will have a woman governor. I think today, if we had a strong woman candidate that was, would run for office uh, for presidency in Kenya, they would have a very good chance of winning. Uh, I, there's no longer a question about the ability, the capacity of a woman to run for office, hold public office high office in terms of integrity, in terms of delivery. Um, we have gone past that mark. So right now in Kenya where we are, we're just waiting for the woman to come up and stand up and say, listen, I'm giving myself, um, you know, for service to the country and to the nation and to the people of Kenya. What would you attribute as the reason for this seemingly uh, inadequate participation of women in politics here in Nigeria? Culture. I think the, the culture, as I've seen, suppresses uh, uh, women leadership and empowerment and, uh, and reverence to age. We in Kenya look at capacity and ability, regardless of age, regardless of tribe, regardless of class. If you're able to mobilize and if you're able to lead, we have a 23-year-old member of parliament who won his election riding a bicycle and he was blessed by the elders. But you see, when you have to come and prostrate every time you meet your elder or every time you meet the older woman, and older women also suppress younger women. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. And so every time you have to do this, then it means you're taking a step back and it means you always then give way for them to be the ones to continue leading and suppressing. And culture is not a bad thing. And respect is a very, very good thing. But because Africans forget their history, and it was written by our colonial masters, we've always given reverence to those that suppress us. And that's not how it was before. Historically, in Africa, before the king would make a decision, he would meet the queen and her court and ask for their advice. And then he would go and speak to the young people and also seek their advice before coming to make a decision. But today, it seems like it's um, a special club of uh, older, especially in Nigeria, the older, you know, male that is prostrated for. Is, is it possible And called to Oga, change? you know, Al Haji, yes, sir. Uh, and that's not how we are going to develop as a continent. So is it possible? Do you see a change in that scenario that you just painted in the not too distant future, hopefully? In Nigeria or in Africa? In Nigeria and by extension, Africa. Absolutely. I mean, because it's still even, affecting the, other even Africans. the last election, I mean, really, I think the, the, the win in the last election was, was a major move by young people that came out to decide what they want. We've also seen the not too young to run campaign, um, which shows that you know young people are getting organized and uh, mobilizing themselves to be able to have a voice and to be able to say, listen, you know, it's our turn now. This platform is going to be shared. Um, although I must tell young people that it's, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. What you do. Yeah. Um, so saying is fine and having a campaign on social media is fine. Twitter has never won anyone any elections, uh, neither has Facebook. Uh, that is important to note. So in Kenya, we've mobilized ourselves. I mean, we have governors that are 30 years old. 
Well, I don't know how familiar you, you are with the not too young to run uh, law here in Nigeria mm -hmm. and some of the issues that I come am. up with it. Okay, so <laughs> you, will, you will be able to respond to this. And going by what we're seeing, some, uh, even within the young people now, disagreement, who is going to come up? Uh, there's something about the pact uh, that wanted to bring up a consensus candidate mm -hmm. or they did bring up a consensus candidate and then there was issues with that. Do you truly believe mm -hmm. that African youths are ready for leadership? African youths have been ready for leadership from the day they were born. It's, and, and that's what I'm saying. I'm, I've been giving examples of, of young people that have... Uh, held public office from South Africa uh, to see what happened in Tahrir Square, you know, uh, in north of Africa. East of Africa is a wonderful example of young people in, in, in office. I mean, I was appointed ambassador at 24. Our youngest governor is 31. Our youngest senator is 28. These are people that are elected. Um, and it's the same story across East Africa. Even here, you believe that same thing. In Nigeria, here in Nigeria, it's the same thing. So the fact that there's no consensus is, is not a problem. The issue is that at least Nigerians are talking about it. And the first step is to actually have that discussion. Once the discussion starts, it's, it's never straightforward and it's never easy. Um, so it's a beginning and it's a good beginning and it's about time because Nigeria actually should be leading on the continent. Indeed we should be. Yes. Well, thank you very much so far. We will take a very short break. We'll come back. We're still talking with Ambassador Yvonne Kamati. She will be sharing her thoughts on other issues as it affects women and the youth. So stay with us. What is government and who is government? Leadership are the people we elect in Kenya. You can inherit land from your father as a girl, from your husband as a woman. You can buy land by yourself. Ancestral land can be in your name. So it doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter race, it doesn't matter on, tribe. On, on Let's move a little bit away from politics and talk about other issues that affect women. And one of them is female genital mutilation. Um, we do know that in Nigeria, most women are still victims of this. What do you think needs to change for us to stop this culture-based violence on women? You talked about the place of culture earlier, mm. and we still have that affecting women, female genital uh, mutilation. It, it must be a constitutional matter. It's a human rights issue. Women's rights are human rights. And it's a cultural issue, or we think. I, I don't know where in our history we started uh, circumcising or mutilating women's genitalia. But the thing is the law must protect its people and its citizens. And that's one of the things that women legislators must put into place. It must be there. There must be a law that provides for the protection of women, young women. Do you think yeah. the laws are enough? For instance, in your country, a woman was um, arrested, an elderly woman was arrested for practicing FGM. Mm -hmm. what, do you think the laws are but enough, is that, basically? That's, is that that's not proof that the law is enough? The fact that she was arrested is but proof. But was she convicted? That's the second oh, part. Oh, in Kenya, it's a very serious offense. And not only are you arrested, you're con not only are you convicted, my friend, you're going to go and stay in prison for a very, very long time. And um, the law is the beginning. And one of the things that we must learn as Africans is to respect the law, the rule, the constitution, and also strengthen institutions uh, that they're that act, you know. Uh, for example, the, I don't know in Nigeria if you have Directorate of, of Public Prosecution, we do. Criminal Investigation, the Judiciary. If these arms of government are strengthened and they're able to do their work and resources, are, uh, and they have the resources, adequate resources to be able to go in and monitor and arrest while another arm of government is also sensitizing and teaching our women in the rural areas, our men and our young people on the ills of some of these uh, backward, you know, cultural practices, then it works. But then again, it must be something that is working both ways. As the law takes course, there must be civic and public participation and education. All right, let's, let's take a look at the issue of um, 
gender equality. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this, there was a time that we felt the women were not given enough opportunity. And now it seems, it seems there is too much attention on women education. Do you think there's likely to come a time where there will be an imbalance where the men will, might, might be discriminated against? The time might come, but I'm, I'm sure it's not going to be within our lifetime, meaning we still have a lot to do. <laughs> and no, I'm not biased at all. But you see, that's the issue about affirmative action, is to redress historical wrongs. And this is something that has happened over centuries. So it will still take another century or more to be able to ensure that women have equal footing, equal well, access, wouldn't that equal defeat rights. the purpose of you know ensuring that there is parity between the two sexes? No, that is what is going to ensure that there is parity. That's the whole point of affirmative action. And once there is parity, then there's no need for affirmative action. There are no Scandinavian women shouting women's rights uh, on the street, or we want to see more women in leadership because they have access. And so the day that we have 50-50 in Nigeria, you know, where Mbode is out and there's a woman in, <laughs> and where we have, you know, uh, two strong women candidates that can actually win a presidential election on the ballot, then we can say, okay, let's put affirmative action aside. We have done what we needed to do. We have put our children together, equal as God made them, and... Uh, then we are good to go. Let, let me ask you this question. Do you see yourself as a feminist? No, not at all. Oh, why are you taking that stance? Because it seems a lot of persons say, with what you've accomplished, it will be expected that you would be one of those people championing the cause of women. What, what's your I, definition of feminism? Championing women has nothing to do with feminism. Really? I mean, I, I don't see women as, as the either fairer or better gender. Okay. But I believe that men and women were created to be equal when it comes to certain aspects, when it comes to leadership. I think there should be equality. Okay. When it comes to uh, salaries, I think there should be equality. When it comes to access to basic goods and needs and services, I think there should be equality. So what would you define feminism to be? It's... Um, Championing one gender over the other. No, I'm not championing any gender over the other, but I champion equality and equity. Wow, that's a, that's a controversial <laughs> position to take because feminists will say they're not championing uh, for the woman to be better than the man or higher than the man, but mm -hmm. just those opportunities that you talked about. Yeah, but I wouldn't classify myself so, as a I feminist. Okay, yeah. let's uh, move a little bit away from that and uh, take a look at another contentious issue in Africa, and it has to do with terrorism. Mm -hmm. We know what's going on everywhere. W what are your thoughts? Do you think that African leaders, I know it's not peculiar to Africa, it's a global phenomenon, mm -hmm. but do you think African leaders are doing what they should or doing enough to address this issue? I had the privilege to serve uh, Kenya in our mission to Somalia, um, our embassy in Somalia in Mogadishu. As, and um, I say it's a privilege because, you know, Somalia is, has been a key issue uh, when it comes to security matters uh, in Kenya. Somalia is a good neighbor to Kenya. She's our sister, uh, our sister country. Um, and every time everyone hears Somalia, they think Al Shabaab. Well, the same way, yes. you know, a lot of people here in Nigeria, and they think Boko, Boko Haram. Haram yes. uh, so, you know, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, these are sisters. Uh, <laughs> uh, same MO and um, community-based uh, terror groups themselves. Is it, the, the issue is how much we invest in security as a people, as a country, as a nation. The issue also goes to, in Kenya, we have what we call Nyumbakumi Initiative. This is, Nyumbakumi is 10 house. Nyumba is house in Swahili. Kumi is 10 uh, initiative. And the question that the government was asking is, do you know your neighbor? Because terrorists don't just drop from, well, 
come up from hell. I was going to say drop from heaven. Perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, no, those were the angels that they that yeah. did a long time ago. <laughs> but um, these are people that we live with every single day. These are not strangers. These are people just like you and me. They dress like you and me. They speak like you and me. And they watch everybody and everything that is happening. Um, so this is something that we cannot leave. Terrorism is not something that you leave to the government. Terrorism and security is something that begins with you and me. And so long as we start taking responsibility as citizens, looking at our neighbors, trying to find out is there something funny, is there something fishy. I mean, let me take the Westgate Al-Shabaab attack, which is Westgate Mall in Kenya. There was a lot of ammunition. There were lots of guns. I would like to know, how come nobody saw people ferrying guns and grenades and gunpowder to the largest mall in Kenya? Or the Garissa school shooting? Where were the neighbors when these people were planning? Somebody somewhere must have heard it. Boko Haram. Do you actually believe that nobody in the neighborhood knew that somebody was going to plan to come and kidnap all these girls? Somebody somewhere must have heard it, must have seen it. But why were they scared of speaking? Some would say the government has not created a viable environment for people to willingly come out and say, this is what I saw. What is government and who is government? It's very easy to you know, give blanket condemnation to a amorphous being like government. But government, first and foremost, leadership are the people we elect. And many times we deserve the kind of people that we elect. So you're basically saying select. that citizen participation is key if we need it's to extremely important. make a headway. If we're going to deal with terrorism and we must remove religion from terrorism. Well, that would be a tall order <laughs> Absolutely in not. Africa, no, no, not no. just Nigeria. No, terrorism is, is, is crime. It's thuggery. There's no religion that I know of. Either that Christianity that, or Islam that preach, preaches killing of neighbors or raping of children or bombing of churches or anything like that. Islam is one of the most peaceful religions, you know, for anybody that bothers to, to read. For All me right. as a Christian, I can always say that. And, and the minute we remove religion and try from terrorism and treat it for what it is, absolute pure crime and thuggery, that just these are people that deserve to be behind bars. On a final note, I wouldn't let you go without talking about this particular one, mm -hmm. and that's the welfare of widows mm -hmm. across Africa. We know that there are over 200 million as it stands, and of that number, you have about 20, 21 million children from these people that are not well taken care of. What are your thoughts about how we take care of the widows? I will say something that may not sound very sensitive, but it is what is logical. If a community, if a society, if a nation, if a people are well organized, if you have access to jobs, to healthcare, to housing, to education, if there are funds in place to ensure that you can set up a business, then there's no reason to pity widows or widowers. Because they will be well taken care of. Because they can take care of themselves. But that's not the scenario we have. No, it's not. Just, and that's why I said, yeah. you see, all these problems that we have, it's because there are basic fundamentals that are missing. So a country that can take care of itself, of itself. In Kenya, we have what we call the youth fund. So young people below 35 are able to access, to go to banks and, and access a youth fund to start businesses. Now, the youth fund, there's no interest rate. And if you default, they're not going to come and auction you or take anything from you. We have the women's fund. So women groups can come together and create... Okay, not, not to interrupt you, but I just wanted to add, what, what about the issue of property? Culture has it that, you know, women cannot inherit properties of their spouses when they're gone. The Just law should supersede uh, what we call culture. Again, we've established that we're actually not sure about what the true <laughs> position of African culture is. The law should take care of its citizens, and everyone should have 
access to land, to inheritance, male, female, child, stepchild, whatever it is you want to call it. And, and that again is what I said. And one of the things that I think African countries need to look at again and reevaluate are the constitutions of their countries. What does it say? In Kenya, you can inherit land from your father as a girl, from your husband as a woman. You can buy land by yourself. Ancestral land can be in your name. Um, so it doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter race, it doesn't matter on, tribe. On, on a general note, Daryl, what would or you religion. for, for the, the women that have lost their husbands and they don't have these, you know, these benefits that you mentioned? What, what, what should government do? Or what should the people do? Those that have access to legislate, well, those in the legislative arm should actually relook at the law and make sure it's equitable and it's fair for everybody. I mean, that's the only way that we're going to work this out. It's, it's not, we cannot fight what they say are cultural norms, but what we can do is make sure that human rights and women rights are respected. I so vote the right over. person and vote more women, progressive women and young people, you know? I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to stop. It's been so enlightening talking with you. I wish Thank we had more much. time to continue. Thank you so much for coming. Thank we, you. we have been talking with Ambassador Yvonne Kamati. She has been sharing her thoughts on a number of issues as it affects women, politics, and of course, um, living conditions across Africa. We'll be back again soon enough. My name is Felicity Hazen. Thank you for watching.